Greetings, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Greetings from Javan Jyoti Ashram on this first Sunday of Advent. Thank you for joining me yet again as you do each Sunday in these Burning Bush Encounters series as we encounter Father, Son, and Spirit speaking to us through the Mass readings and my reflections on these readings. My reflection this Sunday is entitled, Are We Ready for Advent? The context of the readings this Sunday is twofold. The Advent season and the beginning of the liturgical year in the Catholic Church. The theme based on the readings is being ready for Advent means perceiving three valuable lessons, patience, prudence, and vigilance that are much needed during the time of Advent, a time of waiting. As a practical consideration, Advent derives from the Latin word advenire, which means to come to. It is a time of waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. According to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Advent season is a time of preparation that directs our hearts and minds to Christ's second coming at the end of time and to the anniversary of our Lord's birth at Christmas. From the earliest days of the church, people have been fascinated by Jesus' promise to come back. The liturgical year begins by preparing Catholics to receive Jesus through scripture, teachings, prayer, but most of all, through the Eucharist. We begin the liturgical year by encountering baby Jesus. And then we journey with Jesus for the rest of the year through different stages of his life, which in turn inspires us to also journey through different stages of our own spiritual lives. In the first reading, Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16, the prophet delivers a prophecy. The days are coming, says the Lord when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and Judah. I will raise up for David a just shoot, which Christians interpret as a fulfillment of God's promise in the person of Jesus. As a practical consideration, at the time Jeremiah began prophesying in the southern kingdom of Judah, that nation was prosperous. But under the rule of new kings, the situation there deteriorated. Jeremiah first announces the lifestyle of the people of Judah as they were turning away from Yahweh and the covenant made with him. Jeremiah foretells of the consequences. Jeremiah then invites the people of Judah to repentance. In this first reading, Jeremiah is now offering consolation to the people of Judah because Judah did eventually fall to the Babylonians. Jerusalem, including the temple, were destroyed, and the majority of the people were taken into exile. Here, Jeremiah is prophesying of a shoot arising from the Davidic line, which would be comforting to those who are in exile, because the Davidic dynasty came to an end when Judah fell to Babylon. While this prophecy offered hope of a shoot to come in the person of a king, it was not the earthly king that the exilic people anticipated. No other king arose from the Davidic line. Not until the coming of Jesus would this prophecy be fulfilled. As a practical application, this reality teaches the value of patience. Jeremiah himself was patient. He started prophesying impending doom to Judah at a time when the nation was stable and wealthy under the rule of King Josiah. Jeremiah saw it under the four new kings, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Judah and his people were deteriorating as the kings were corrupt and the people were stubborn in their ways, being deceived and also disinterested in living as Yahweh instructed them to. He then realized that Babylonian control 
which the Lord had already prophesied through him, was inevitable. As such, he advised that Judah should surrender to Babylon to avoid unnecessary violence and bloodshed. This advice was not taken kindly, so he was subjected to persecution and imprisonment. Because of Jeremiah's long suffering of seeing Judah decline and fall into captivity, and his own personal suffering, he has been referred to as the weeping prophet. Yet, despite the suffering, Jeremiah persisted in carrying out the mission God called him to. Patience is similar to be valued when one considers that Jeremiah's ministry began in 625 BCE, lasted almost 60 years, and Jesus, who is the descendant of David, was not recognized as king until Jesus' resurrection in 30 CE. Jesus, as the promised king from the Davidic line, is the promised shoot, but it took hundreds of years before Jesus came. Jesus fulfills the hope of an eternal Davidic dynasty and for a perpetual priesthood and sacrificial system as the mass readings from the previous Sundays have revealed. In the Gospel reading, Luke 21, 25 to 28, 34 to 36, Jesus himself tells of his second coming. Though at the time Jesus' audience, people in the Jerusalem area, thought that Jesus was speaking about the end of the age, which they believed would indeed be coming. Jesus presents his eschatological discourse, which is teaching of the end times, the final judgment, by using visual and cosmic imagery. Jesus says, there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth, nations will be in dismay. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud and power and great glory. Then Jesus warns, but when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. As a practical application, here Jesus is appealing to his then audience, and by extension to all Christians, that is, Jesus' future audience, to have courage and to not lose hope when the signs appear. By saying that believers must stand erect and raise their heads, Jesus is indirectly empowering them to be prudent. If we Christians believe that this life is truly an earthly pilgrimage, and our final and ultimate destination, which is union with our Father in all eternity, then we must anticipate and welcome our final judgment, the time of our redemption, being saved from sin, gaining salvation. Our lived experiences teach us that before every victory, there is suffering. We can't expect to make this journey of life that holds eternal consequences without having to overcome obstacles and to face challenging, even life-threatening moments. How we prepare to, to face such moments, that is, how we nurture our spiritual lives will make all the difference. We are not meant to be fearful people who place our trust in what we see. We are meant to be people of faith, who put our faith in the one true God, who, though invisible, is truly visible in our daily lives if we are spiritually in tune to recognize God's presence. And as a little testimony, I want to share about the hurricane season in 2017. It was very terrible. Many countries in the Caribbean region as well here in the United States, many um, different states were badly hit one after the other by hurricanes that also came one after the other. In particular, Texas was hit, I believe, by Hurricane Harvey, and they had severe flooding. Many people died in the city areas 
from drowning. So when Hurricane Maria was headed to Florida, people were scared and many people drove out of Florida. It was like a horde of people stampeding out of Florida, heading north to get away from the hurricane, thinking that Florida would suffer the same fate as Texas did. People were saying it was the end times and all these hurricanes were a sign of the end times. And they became fearful. They took their eyes off of Jesus. And I remember that was the first time I started a WhatsApp group for a specific reason. I started a WhatsApp group immediately, two days before the hurricane hit, to start praying away the hurricane. I honestly believed, and everyone in the group who was praying with me believed that God was going to spare Florida. And I remember after starting the group, someone sent me a sketch of Florida and a huge hand. The hand was so huge. The hand was like, like standing upright next to Florida. I'm trying to, to, to give you a good description of it. It's like the hand was holding Florida in the palm of the hand. It was this huge hand and Florida was in the palm of this hand. And when I saw that, I said, God, that is you telling me and the group that you are going to protect Florida. That hand is going to block Hurricane Maria from Florida. It is not going to hit Florida. Even though Hurricane Maria was being tracked to give us a direct hit. And when Hurricane Maria came, Florida was spared. The hurricane turned and we suffered no or very little effects of Hurricane Maria compared with the devastating effects that the Caribbean islands had experienced. And that is because instead of looking at what the secular world was saying, what the news reports were giving, what people were predicting was happening in the world, we put our eyes on God and we believed that he was big enough to save us and he did. He spared Florida. In the gospel reading, Jesus also directly teaches those in the temple area and all believers the necessity of being vigilant. Jesus warns, beware that your hearts do not become drowsy from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life. And that day, that is when the Son of Man comes, catches you by surprise, like a trap. Be vigilant at all times. As a practical application, Jesus is warning of the importance of believers focusing our attention, not on the end times and on all the tribulations that were preceded over which we have no control. We need to instead concentrate on our everyday living in the intersection of contexts we find ourselves, such as gender, race, class, vocation, culture, geographical location, social location, and so on. We all belong to different contexts at the same time that intersect our lives. These areas over which we have a lot of control. This is where we need to put our focus on, these areas that we can control during our pilgrim journey of life. Moreover, we should not even consider secular predictions that arise from the human mind and human motives, as opposed to that of our omniscient and omnipotent God. Because Advent is not a time to engage in speculation, to be preoccupied and burdened with the particulars of daily life. Like Jesus is cautioning, we must be above all vigilant. Advent reminds us that in order to be vigilant, we must take the time to be quiet so as to prepare ourselves for Jesus' coming at Christmas and more so 
for Jesus' second coming. Likewise, vigilance also requires us to be disciplined through fasting and sacrifice in order to open up ourselves to receive Jesus in our hearts and lives in a special way at Christmas, thereby experiencing the complete joy of Christmas. In the second reading, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, 42, Paul in his epistle to the church in Thessalonica encourages the early Christians, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, to be blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Paul also reminds the Thessalonians that they know how to conduct themselves when he writes, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul is reminding the early believers that they have been equipped with the teachings of Jesus that came through him and the other apostles, so they have no excuse not to be prepared, that is, to be blameless and holy when Jesus comes. It's a practical consideration. Present day Christians in general and Catholics in particular, also have no excuse not to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Catholics benefit from instruction by the following. We have sacred scripture, the gospels, which provide Jesus' self-communication to his apostles, which is oral tradition, the apostolic tradition, which is the apostles sharing with Jews and Gentiles the word received from Jesus, as well as the mystical and theological insights given to them by the Holy Spirit, which is written tradition. The patristic writings of the church fathers, who were members of the generation that followed the apostolic age, which is also written tradition. And tradition as doctrine, accounts, or customs that are transmitted from one generation to another as well as the magisterium of the church, which safeguards tradition and sacred scripture. It's a practical application. This Advent, as we remember and celebrate Jesus's birth and patiently wait for Jesus's second coming, Jesus will surely come into our lives in new ways. And I'd like to share a little testimony here and the whole idea of being patient and vigilant and prudent. About 15 years ago, I was all excited for Advent and I took out three or four different Advent reflection books, which I was gonna be reading during Advent. I promised God to pray more, to spend this time reflecting more, spending more time with him in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Even though I, I went every day to adoration, I still promised Jesus more. But as Advent began that Sunday, that Sunday night, my, my stomach was sick. And by Monday, I had diarrhea. And I said, Jesus, I'm now beginning my Advent. And here I am sick. And I can't fast as I, I would want to fast today. And I just feel like it's not, my Advent began in a bad mood. That evening when I was praying and I opened one of my books of reflections, I was reading what Jesus said, as Advent has begun, I'm purifying you. And I saw my diary got purged as a purification. It was symbolic as well as representative of what Jesus was doing in me spiritually. He was spiritually cleansing me so that I could begin Advent and go through Advent spiritually prepared, more spiritually grounded. And that was my first lesson in making Advent more holy rather than spending Advent preparing for Christmas. Because for my whole life, Advent is a time to prepare for Christmas, to bake nice things, because I love to bake, desserts. 
It was a time for fun, time to go shopping, to decorate the house. I didn't spend as much time. I did pray every day. I did go to mass every day. But my focus was on Christmas. It was about the holiday. It was about a celebration. It was not about the journey. The journey of spiritual preparation to receive Jesus in a special way at Christmas. That is the gift we really celebrate. Not what people are going to give us that we're going to put under our Christmas trees or what we're going to give others, but what Jesus is going to give to us when he comes to us in a powerful way at Christmas. So that was my first lesson. And then a second lesson came this year when, again, I'm about to prepare for Christmas. This is like a reminder, because it's like 15 years later. Of course, since that first lesson, I have made my Advent seasons holier. I made a huge effort to make Advent special. But then this year, I got an invitation for Shalom Media Ministry, a ministry I volunteer with here in the United States, which began in India. To do, I got an invitation to do a Daniel fast, beginning on December 1st and ending on December 21st. And I said, wow, Jesus, we had 11 months for the year, but we, they chose to do a Daniel fast in December, the month when everybody wants to be eating nice things, to be baking like myself, making nice cakes and different um, goodies. And I wouldn't be able to eat any until the 22nd. And I see this as Jesus telling me again, this is your time of spiritual purification and preparation. I'm purifying you from all that junk that you eat, but also the junk in your life, the things that need to come out. And as you purify yourself by eating a vegetarian food, by fasting, by praying, by going through this Daniel fast, by listening to the reflections that will be shared each day, by going through the healing prayers that will be shared each day as well, you will really be preparing yourself to receive Jesus in a mighty and powerful way. And I thank God for reminding me yet again what Advent means as he did this day. I'd like to leave you with this prayer. Lord, by your grace, this Advent will enable me to grow spiritually by leaps and bounds. Amen. And I claim this for each and every one of you. Have a blessed week.